G'day mate, Forty here. So there was a terrific article in Politico back in 2017 why Republicans can't find the big voter fraud conspiracy. So all this discussion about vote fraud has been going on since the National Voter Registration Act passed in 1993, which eased up voting. And it's part of a long disagreement between the two major American political parties. So the the American Democratic Party really got its origins with Andrew Jackson in the 1820s. The modern-day Republican Party got its origins in the 1850s. But uh, even back then, there were controversies between the two parties about voter fraud or voter registration or how easy do you want to make it for people to register to vote. So there was James Madison Porter. He was Secretary for War in the 1840s. He lived from 1793 to 1862, and he was a conservative. He was on the side of the the proto-Republican Party, and he notes that one of the leading characteristics of distinction between the two great and leading political parties of this country when we had parties formed on principle was the fact that the federal party, meaning the the proto-Republican Party, was for restraining the right of suffrage, right? Wanted to restrict the vote. And by contrast, Democrats wanted to make the vote as easy as possible. So modern political distinctions got their, got their shape with the Democrat, with the uh, French parliament at the end of the 18th century. So parties that supported the king sat to his right. Parties that uh, did not support the king sat to his left. But uh, there are more fundamental distinctions that go back to you know, thousands of years. And those are essentially the differences between it's left. Do you prioritize hierarchy or do you prioritize equality? How easy should it be to S-post, says uh, Elliot Blatt. Oh, Laponius Meridius Maximus is here. I know people can't wait to talk about vote fraud. And uh, I've got an inspiring story for you coming up. How a Montana mom became a leader in fighting anti-Semitism. We're talking about the heroic Tanya Gersh. I've, uh, oh, I, I forgot to send the invite to Duvid. So as soon as, as soon as Duvid gets here, we're going to talk about the Tanya Gersh story. So let me pull it together here. I was saying, I probably should take a break first, but let me just get this thought out. Listen to this headline. Bar Mitzvah tutor guilty of molestation. Now, i got to tell you something. I am a, I'm a Bar Mitzvah boy. And you do you take these Bar Mitzvah lessons. I was tutored in uh, Bar Mitzvah. Are you alone with a gun? Yeah, sometimes. Yes, yes, you are. Well. I had only wished my tutor would have blown me. <laughs> oh. I'd rather be get blown, out of here, I'd rather be blown by an <laughs> old <laughs> rabbi than sit there and learn this fucking... I mean, this Hebrew... It would have been so traumatizing to you to look down Robin, and see that... Robin, my rabbi was as heinous as could be. The guy who taught me my Haftorah smelled... Yeah. He was... Uh, he had big, thick... thick there were two different ones. I would rather they pulled my pants down and suck me off than sit there and learn this Hebrew, which I have never oh. used. No one ever taught me how to translate it. It was the biggest waste of my time. Reciting this, what they call a Haftorah in Hebrew... It was like learning Klingon. Learning Klingon would have been more useful because Klingon, at least I could get on the radio and impress you with. I could, you know, say, hey, I'm going to speak Klingon now. You would sit there and go, hey, that's pretty cool. It was a ridiculous thing. I spent years of my life studying this Torah, but not in English, in Hebrew that I don't speak. And to have the, 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 the dried out bearded lips of a rabbi wrapped around my cock would have been preferable. That's, and I'm not kidding. I and and I'm like, hey, listen, I'll kick your ass right now. You call me homosexual. I think that you are underestimating the trauma. Oh, of having blow me right now! <laughs> Dare. Unless I, I, you've done this and you know you won't be affected by. Let it. me tell you something. I'd rather I'd rather blow you than try to teach you here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, so anyway, this uh, Bar Mitzvah tutor took the stand to deny molesting teens, but he didn't convince a Brooklyn judge who convicted him of sexually abusing two victims. Uh, Yona Weinberg, 31, was acquitted of eight other counts, including a felony, but still 31. faces up 31 counts. I wish he would have blown me 31 times, as long as I didn't have to learn that thing. 31, that horny bastard. Uh, my God, in heaven. <laughs> At least I would have been up to something interesting. There was nothing going on in that room except did this. They... What does that mean? Yeah. But did they have to do that while he was <laughs> molesting them? Or yeah, of did course. They get to be well, of course he has to do it while they're molesting because you have to learn it. How people will get wise that he's not really teaching. <laughs> 
What does that mean? What use is that to me? I had to learn that song and those words for two years with no vowels in, in these weird letters. Wow. And it makes no sense. Well, a blowjob from the rabbi, okay. At least makes me interesting. You know why there's something going on. <laughs> Can't coming. wait to get to Hebrew school. <laughs> if I was his student, I would have begged him to blow me. <laughs> Do anything to get this boredom over with. <laughs> he picked the wrong not student. Have taken two years to learn it. <laughs> That's right. Weinberg, a social worker, was found guilty of molesting one boy in his home and a synagogue ritual bath. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I would have loved a bath. <laughs> and the other in a van and, a yesh and the yeshiva stairwell. Well, you didn't tell me it was romantic. <laughs> That's right. Believe me, you wish a guy would give you a bath. How come these guys are so gentle with young boys? When's the last time a guy bathed you? Oh, it's been a while. And it sounds like your teacher never took a bath. Uh, oh yeah, you have yeah, no idea. He didn't use the ritual bath himself. I swear to God. Okay, let's let's get uh, serious here. Let's cool it with the anti-Semitism. We'll keep an eye on the Tiger Woods story. Apparently, he was going at a high rate of knots at about seven twelve a.m. when he rolled his car in Palos Verdes, suffered uh, leg injuries, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on this story. Apparently, early word is that alcohol was not involved. Anyway, I'm. I'm enjoying this Lorraine Maniti book, The the Myth of Voter Fraud. There's just so much to learn here. Federal monitoring of elections been around since the Reconstruction period. It's usually been directed toward defending constitutionally protected voting rights and minority groups at the polls. All right. Press one in the chat if you come to this show primarily for information. Uh, press two in the chat if you come to the show primarily for entertainment. Press three if you primarily come to the show for spiritual wisdom. And press four in the chat if you primarily come to this live stream for the community. So for the vast majority of Americans committing an act of voter fraud, so forging a voter registration card, stealing an identity to vote more than once, to knowingly vote illegally, is even more irrational than the individual act of voting. What would an individual voter on their own get out of committing an election crime? The incentives to cast an illegal ballot need to be pretty high to risk a felony conviction and five years in jail. So when I talk to people who believe in massive amounts of voter fraud, at least the possibility of massive amounts of voter fraud in the 2020 election, they understand that uh, people don't do this primarily uh, on an individual basis because they, they understand that the incentives are strongly against people uh, committing voter fraud for an individual, right? So on the downside, if you get caught, you get you can get a felony conviction, five years in prison. On the upside, your one vote may sway an election, but your one vote's almost never going to sway an election. All right. Laponius Maximus Meridius Ford reads yet another book. Are you saying that I need to go to podcasting school, Laponius? Because that's what it feels like to me. I think you want to send me to pod school. I mean, that's just... Welcome That's to the just what I'm podcast. hearing. Hello and welcome to the show. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to be a great co-host. I am training a bunch of people at the moment in how to do co-hosted shows. And I'm picking up a lot of things that people are doing that I thought it might be really useful to share so that if you are getting into a co-hosted show, you can just be as killer a co-host as possible. So let's kick it off. One of the first things that you need to do if you are going to be in a co-hosted show is that you must always turn up prepared. Even if your co-host is going to be running the content of the show, or even if you break your show up into little segments, Segments and your co-host runs some segments and you run others. Anything that your co-host has responsibility for, you need to still be fully briefed on. If you are learning about things from scratch when you are actually recording, it's going to be a lot harder for you to chip in with anything useful. It will also be quite nerve wracking for you because if you are learning things in the moment as the mics are live, you are trusting your brain to work overtime to come up with things in the moment that will add value. It is much easier to think about those things ahead of time, have a whole bunch of bullet point things that you can throw into the conversation. And then if things happen naturally or something pops into your head. Oh yeah, press five if you come to the show primarily to hear read Luke read books aloud. <laughs> okay, so the, there are all sorts of people making bank, right? Hosts are tapping pros to polish their podcast. The pandemic has been a boon for services uh, aimed at fledgling shows. Hosts are tapping pros to polish their podcasts. The pandemic has been a boon for services aimed at fledgling shows. By Ann Cadet Photographs by Lila on the Tula Bahrain for the Wall Street Journal. February 23, 2021, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Annette Perel knows that anyone with a laptop and a microphone can produce their own podcast at home.
the Manhattan doula tried a few years ago, recording a pop culture show with her niece. It lasted four episodes. So last year, in launching a more ambitious effort, an interview podcast featuring people of color working in the birthing world, she decided to get help. Most weeks, she goes to Gotham Podcast Studio in Manhattan to record her hour-long The Clear Birth podcast with a guest. The studio charges her about $400 for each episode to handle the production, recording, editing, and digital distribution, no drop in the bucket. Ms. Perel, who works full-time running her doula business, says she'd rather invest the money than spend time producing a podcast. And though it's been slow to take off, getting 40 downloads an episode, the show has produced several new clients, not to mention new connections with guests. I'm talking with the people I want to meet, Ms. Perel says. Last year, the number of podcasts available online through services such as Apple Podcasts and Spotify more than doubled, to 1.7 million, according to Chartable, a Manhattan-based podcast reach and engagement measurement service. And that, in turn, has spurred huge demand for services aimed at helping ordinary people become the next Joe Rogan. Here in New York City, where 25% of the world's top 100 podcasts are produced, according to Chartable, fledgling hosts are ponying up for podcasting, consulting, and coaching services. Look okay, so this reminds me when I came to Los Angeles in March, end of March, like March 30th of 1994, and my previous girlfriend used to work at the Ford Modeling Agency. So she told me, oh, you should get into modeling. So I was, I was 27. I mean, I, I, think I, I think I still had it. I mean, I, I don't like to... I don't like to boast, but uh, I mean, you can judge for yourself. Like I thought, oh, maybe, you know, my girlfriend, like she, she knew every, every inch of me. Maybe she spotted some hidden talent. I never really thought about being an actor or model. So... I, I moved to Los Angeles and I knew I needed to get a job. So I pick up the LA Weekly, I look at the Help Wanted and uh, it's dominated by people. Apparently they want actors and models. So I was like, oh, bloody hell, 40, 40, 40 is going to be an actor and a model. So I thought I'd check it out. And uh, then there are all these ads like promising, you know, wonderful, wonderful ways to expand your, launch your acting, you know, modeling career. So I, I, I landed an agent, Debbie Durkin, and uh, this was really exciting. And okay, it had the downside. She wanted me to take these expensive classes that would be like $2,500 for like a two day intensive, but it was really intense. So I think they got, might've got my money's worth. She sent me out on about 20 auditions. I even got one call back. Uh, I didn't land anything through her, but I kind of got to experience Hollywood and it's just so, erotically charged it was very exciting after six years on my sick bed i figured i should i should at least try to do the very opposite of what i was doing before i got sick so prior to getting sick i was studying calculus getting getting ready for for a degree in economics and so i thought oh acting modeling that's the opposite of studying calculus and and apparently there was a big demand in japan for, for models and okay i wasn't the most in shape you know i'd been lying in bed for six years but uh, I still had that raw animal charisma. And so I'd go to these auditions or I'd sign up for these classes and they'd, they'd promise all these wonderful things. I was, I was living out of this car, this 1977 Dustin station wagon, but I had towels. So I was able to put up towels on against all the windows and uh, get to know the, the Los Angeles ladies a little bit better in the intimacy, the peace and the, the quiet of this uh, 1977 Dutson station wagon. That was very exciting, and I, I kind of realized that I was being scammed. Like part of me was saying, "Hey, you're being scammed." Uh, I remember I paid five hundred dollars for one consultation with a manager, and uh, when I caught him up, he said, "Well, if you want to know my credentials, look me up. Here I am in profiled in Life magazine." So he was like the real deal. So in, in retrospect, I realized that uh, I was essentially paying for a dream. Like I was paying for people to enable my fantasy. So just like uh, pod school, right? This is, the money is in selling people the dream of being podcast stars, right? So I was paying for the dream. I was paying for the, the delusion of uh, being a star. And so I think most of the people here are paying for uh, pod, pod school. They're getting taken, not the pod school who's Australian, you know, the Australian host got a lovely accent, not that particular pod school. She's the best. 
Believe me, the very best. Concessions at podcast studios and hiring freelance editors in their efforts to break through. While anyone can produce a podcast at home for free, these independent creators are spending anywhere from hundreds to $1,000 plus to produce each episode. The market is vast because it includes, well, just about everyone with a mouth. Dan Bobkoff, an executive producer of podcasts at Oxios, who teaches a podcasting and storytelling intensive class at NYU School of Professional Studies, says he's been offering the non-credit $749 course six times a year to meet demand from people ranging from college students to retirees. Students have included a professor launching a science show and a dentist planning a politics podcast. I love the class because it's so diverse in every sense of the term, Mr. Bobkoff says. Matt Peters, co-founder and co-owner of Gotham Podcast Studio, launched the business in 2017 after failing to find a place to record his own martial arts podcast. It has since outgrown its space three times and now has a half dozen competitors in Manhattan. While it's possible to record a decent sounding show at home with a $150 setup, it's not so easy in noisy New York City. That's one of the things we bank on, Mr. Peters says. In rural Idaho, this wouldn't work. Basic studio time starts at $60 an hour. Mr. Peters says there currently are more than 100 podcast recording episodes at his venue, including five fellows hosting a three hour podcast about shoes and a Jewish nonprofit producing Schmaltzy, a food show. Mr. Peters also is seeing more demand for production packages, charging $1,000 an episode for a soup to nut service that offers everything from guest booking to transcription. So I went to one of those like shared working uh, spaces and uh, they had they had like a, a podcasting studio. I, I didn't expect that. You could, I think just for like 400, 500 a month, you could hang out in the in the hangout space at one of those, you know, WeWork operations and uh, look really cool. You got a, a complimentary breakfast and uh, coffee all day and you could be up, you know, high overlooking beautiful West Los Angeles. And I think the price has started about $500 a month just to hang out there. And then you could have your own small office and then you could uh, rent and use the podcasting studio. So this is, this is a uh, real thing apparently. Clients include a Long Island nursing home and a motivational speaker. What do these people have in common? Everyone wants to make money, he says. Good luck with that. The Interactive Advertising Bureau, a digital ad marketing industry group, projects the sector earned just under $1 billion in ad revenue last year. That works out to roughly $550 for each podcast. Most earned nothing. On the other hand, few of the million-plus podcasts available online represent serious efforts. Only 25% of new shows make it past the 10-episode mark, says Dave Zorob, co-founder and CEO of Chartable. The majority are people in their basement just trying it out, he says. It's like blogs back in the day. And for those producing a quality, consistent show, the economics aren't as daunting as one might imagine. Advertising sponsors typically pay $25 to $35 for every 1,000 downloads. Assuming two ads for each episode, a solo podcaster producing a weekly show. Okay, so I usually average about, you know, two downloads. But what about my plays? I get 50, 60 plays on my, my podcast, the, the MP3 version. So, uh, I mean, are they using downloads as shorthand for plays? Because I don't do so well with the downloads. So could earn a six-figure income off an audience of 50,000. It's also possible for a podcast with an even smaller reach to pay handsomely if it targets the right niche, says Matthew Passy, a podcast consultant based in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Some of his clients, which include local financial advisors, doctors, and lawyers, charge advertisers more than $500 for 1,000 downloads. Mr. Passy says demand... Okay, so at that rate, I could probably make about 50 cents per per advertiser per episode. All right, so there's this really good uh, pod school. So it's got tons of free podcasts online. Rachel Corbett here, Aussie lady. It was unexpected. Great. You can add that in, but you've also got all of these things written down, all of these things that you've already spoken about. That means you're never going to be throwing the ball and drop it or have your co-host talking about something and slowly getting to the end of their point And you're sitting there thinking, holy crap, I have to say something in a second and there is nothing but blank space and a tumbleweed going through my head right now. Being prepared is not just respectful for your co-host and helpful for them. It's also helpful for you because there is no worse feeling than crapping your dax behind the microphone thinking, oh my God, I've got nothing to add. It just gives you a security blanket that means that you can have the confidence to really be there in the moment, be present, be listening to your co-host and go off on any tangents that present themselves because you've always got the security blanket of that preparation to go back to. It will make you a much better performer. It will make you more confident. It will also make you a much better person to work with from a co-host perspective because you're like, oh gosh, this person always has something to bring to the table. They never leave me hanging. They always pick up the ball. That's really essential to a good Good dynamic on a show so make sure that you are prepared so you've always got something to bring just be mindful of not going too over the top with the preparation so with some people that I work with I'll often find that I'll get them to prepare something and then they'll come into the studio and they will have practiced almost word for word what they're going to say so I'll say this and then you say this and then I'll say this and then you'll say that this is a really difficult way to jump into okay I've never had a co-host who's that uh, that degree of prepared all right what is borderline personality disorder you may be asking so personality disorder is like I'll probably mess it up. So BPD is something that a lot of us struggle with. We may have been told by one person that we're diagnosed with it, or we have BPD-like symptoms. And a lot of us just wonder, what the heck does that mean? 
And if I do have it, why is everybody act like it's such a bad thing, right? Now, just to give you a little background on what borderline personality disorder is, is it's really, in my opinion, it's our mind's way of coping with things. And I'm gonna read to you a little bit from the DSM so that you know when someone says you may have uh, BPD-like symptoms or you actually have BPD, what they're really talking about, okay? And I'll try to make this very clear and concise because a lot of times people throw words around that don't really pertain to us. And I want you to, I wanna make sure you understand what BPD really is. So the DSM states that we have to have five or more of the following. And this is the older DSM because the new one isn't quite out yet. So um, when the new one comes out, I'll get it and then we'll see if there's any changes, but I don't think there is to this. So the first one, and the one I've talked about before in another one of my videos is frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. And this was in my fear of abandonment um, video. And this one's probably the most common that I see in borderline patients, but like I said, you have to have five or more. That's only one. The second, a pattern of unstable or intense interpersonal relationships characterized by alternating between extremes of idealization and devaluation. Now in the therapy- Okay, so my experience with borderline is everything's fine and then suddenly out, out of the blue, the other party, the, the borderline just gets this massive shame attack, which they can't handle. And so they translate it into anger and rage. So everything's going along, going along that boom, and you have no idea what you did, but somehow something you said or did or some memory or something flashed upon her. And so she, the, the uh, women get this much more than men. The other party suddenly gets overwhelmed by such a high amount of rage and anxiety that they lash out. So a lot of people, when they're distressed, when they're struggling, when they're hurting, when they're in pain, when their life doesn't work, they can't just sit and handle the pain, the distress, the anxiety they have to lash out. And so borderline is when it's just unpredictable. Something comes along that triggers such a rush of shame that they can't handle it. So you can measure your maturity by how much distress, how much stress, how much anxiety and suffering you can handle without lash lashing out at yourself or others. The world we talk about it, people putting us on a pedestal or throwing us under the bus. So you either love me or you just hate my guts and you wish I go away, right? It's that Okay, so this is like many of the people who come into my chat. One day they love me, one day they hate me. So they, they oscillate between uh, putting me on a pedestal and putting me in the trash heap. So this is true for, for many of my viewers. Extreme, up and down. And that's usually what people will notice first is that because they're in relationships with you. So if you're hating them and loving them in two days, they're like, oh, you know. Yes, it can overlap with NPD, but uh, NPD is narcissistic personality disorder. And what it has in common with narcissistic personality disorder is this tendency to idealize and then devalue, to oscillate between idealize and devalue. But with, with uh, borderline personality disorder, you have no doubt that you're dealing with someone who's very sick. So narcissists by and large, they, they are able to function in, in the real world. But borderline personalities, they just have such enormous attacks of shame, and then they lash out with enormous amounts of anger. So borderlines tend to have much less control of themselves than narcissists. And that can be really hard. Now, the third one is identity disturbance, markedly and persistently unstable self-image or sense of self. Okay, so narcissists don't have identity disturbance. They don't have this markedly and persistently unstable self-image or sense of self. Now we're all like, oh, wow, well, that applies to a lot of people. And that's why you have to have at least five of these. But I think that, that one point is why it's so linked to eating disorders, okay? Because we don't think very highly of ourselves. We have a very distorted vision of who we are and what we're about. And that can lead to a lot of other things like, like eating disorders, right? And then the next one is impulsivity in at least two areas that are potentially self-damaging. This could be anything from spending habits, like we'll go on spending sprees, or it could be sex. Yeah, so all the bottom lines I've known have been women and they've pretty much all been hot. Uh, most of them, but uh, some of them, they, they present perfectly normal, but they can't sustain relationships. And you can go on a date to three dates, but it's it's only when she starts spending extensive amounts of time with them that uh, this, this rage and rage at others, rage at themselves because they're overwhelmed by shame will just start showing up. Sex, where we um, have sex with a bunch of different strangers and it's not really, we're not safe about it and we just act impulsively, right? It can be any kind of thing like that. I think in here they say, yeah, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating. Right. So women who, who give it away fairly easily, usually mentally ill. So sluts, disproportionate amount of borderline personality disorder, other personality disorders. So again, connected to eating disorders, right? Then the next one, the fifth one, is recurrent suicidal behavior, gestures or threats, or self-mutilating behavior. Now okay, so narcissists don't uh, generally have recurrent suicidal behavior. So this is another distinction between borderline personality and narcissism. This was my frustration with the new DSM because self-mutilating behavior or self-harm 
doesn't just occur when we have borderline personality disorder, but the DSM only puts it in here. So we'll work on that, right? But a lot of us struggle with suicide, and I find with my borderline patients, many of them use suicide and suicidal ideation as a way to work on that abandonment because they're afraid someone's going to run away. So then we act out and we say, well, I'm going to commit suicide or I'm going to hurt myself, and, and that gets people back in our lives, right? And that makes sense. I can see the connection, can't you? So that's kind of how that's used. The sixth thing is. So the borderlines I've known tend to have a lot of STDs. They tend to slut it out over the weekend. Often they, they make a lot of bad decisions in their sex life. Uh, they t most of them have tended to be pretty attractive. And uh, you wouldn't know that they were losers just on their immediate appearance. Effective instability due to a marked reactivity of mood. So this is like... Okay, effective instability means they're all over the place emotionally. That, that one minute they're g giggling, the next minute they're crying, next minute they're filled with rage, uh, next minute they're withdrawn. And uh, they're usually kicked off into the more reactive parts of their personality, either lashing out at themselves or others, when they get such an amount of, of shame that they can't handle. So... Until maybe the last three or four years, I would get persistent shame attacks. I would I remember something I said or did, and I just felt horrible, and I just wanted to shrink. Or interacting with a certain person, thinking about a certain person, talking to certain people, uh, people throwing certain things in my face, and I'd become overwhelmed by shame. You're intensely irritable or anxiety, and it's usually, it lasts for a couple hours, so our mood is just unstable. It's all over the place. I might be really happy one minute and then really mad and sad the next. It's like, ah, it's all over, and it feels really crazy. So that, but it doesn't usually last more than a couple hours, at the most a day. If it lasts longer than that, then it might be bipolar, which I'll talk about in another video. Let's not get distracted, okay? On to the next one. So number seven is chronic feelings of emptiness. Now, I know we're all thinking, well, shit, Katie, I feel like that, that's me. Oh, but remember, we have to have five of these, and you may feel like a lot of these pertain to you and oh, I can really connect with that. And that's why you may have heard, oh, I, you have borderline tendencies or borderline like symptoms, right? Because we don't meet all criteria. So that was the seventh. There's two more. I'm almost done. Now the eighth is inappropriate, intense anger or difficulty controlling anger. Now this is that I feel like a lot of these kind of go hand in hand, but with the eating disorders and self-harm, you know, how I just talked about in my PTSD video, how we're anger out or we're anger in. Well, this is saying that we have inappropriate, intense anger. So we really don't have a place to put it and we don't really know why it's there, but we feel it and it's bad and blah, you know? So that's another way it relates. And the last one is transient stress-related paranoia or paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptoms. Now that also kind of goes in line with my- Okay, and this is not uh, part of narcissistic personality. The, so there are a lot of different uh, symptoms here, quite different from narcissism and histrionic personality disorder. PTSD video, because remember how I talked about the ways that we kind of deal with a situation and some of us can actually dissociate like, um, I'm trying to think of what I even talked about. My binge, when I talk about binging and bulimia, when you're kind of an out-of-body experience, like, I can't handle this, I'm stepping out, ugh, and you like watch. So porn stars tend to disassociate. Uh, almost all porn stars were sexually abused as kids. They learn to disassociate during sex so that they can put on a performance because it's not really them. It's this entirely different character and they kind of float out of their bodies while, you know, 16 dudes in a row are pronging them. So porn stars, a lot of troubled women, have a dissociative disorder where they kind of leave their bodies and uh, this enables them to be be sluts watch yourself doing stuff that's kind of what disassociation is because we are too intense everything is too intense that we can't even be present like fully present in the in the moment okay so that's what borderline personality disorder is and you can see how it ties into our self-harm behaviors and our eating disorder but remember we have to meet five of those criteria to be properly diagnosed and we may go in and out, we may meet some sometimes and some not the other times, but that gives you an idea of what it is. Now, the dirty little secret of therapy and kind of something that I think is really important for you to know, and I, I feel like many therapists might be like, well, thank God somebody's finally telling people this because I know a lot of you tell me all the time, yeah, I keep getting passed around and people will say, oh, I don't really deal with that and, and we don't know what to do. We're like, well, holy moly, I've been looking for therapy forever and I finally get to see somebody and then you're like, I don't see you. Great, thanks for nothing, right? And it's really frustrating and that can happen a lot and that even perpetuates our struggle with abandonment if we are borderline, right? We're like, holy moly. So. Why does that happen? Why? Why do we feel like we're so like the black sheep? And that's really 